Today, we're going to read from Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 41. Okay? Let's all read together. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Okay, let's sit down. Are you ready to be baptized? That's the title of the sermon today. All of you know I've already announced that this Thanksgiving Sunday we'll be having baptism. Uh, we're going to have a joint service, the KM, EM, YM, everybody will see and we're all going to have service together at the main sanctuary and there Whoever wants to be baptized will get an opportunity to be baptized. So, I wanted all of you to have a really solid understanding of what baptism really means. Whether you are really ready or not, because this is very, very important in your life, in your faith, in your commitment to Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, let's look at verse the first verses. Verse 36. If we look at verse 36, this is, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. First thing we have to do is, know for certain that Jesus, who was crucified for our sin, is both Lord and Christ. Lord and Messiah. Do you know for certain that Jesus is both Lord and Christ? Is Jesus Christ, who was crucified, who died for your sin, is He Lord and Messiah for you? That's the first condition of baptism. Is Jesus Christ your Savior, your Messiah? Let me see your hand. Okay. Even a pinky is fine. Okay. Is he your Lord? Let me see your hand. You know what's funny thing is many of us are ready to accept Jesus Christ as our Messiah, as our Christ, as our Savior. But not many of us are ready to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, the Master of my life. I have no problem Jesus being my Savior. Jesus saved me. But then when Jesus says, I'm your Lord, I'm your master, do as I say, then I start having a little bit of conflict. Because I want salvation, but I want to do what I want to do. But Lord Jesus Christ saying is the first condition for baptism is this, you can't have without the other. You can't just have a savior and not have him as your Lord and your master. If He is your Savior, if He is your Messiah, then He has to be your Lord. You cannot separate the two. It's impossible. What it says is here, you have to know for certain, beyond any doubts, you have to truly believe, not just an idea, but you have to truly know. It says in ESV, it says this, 
for to know for certain do you know for certain do you have no doubt that's the question can you be a christian and have doubts can you be a christian and not know for certain where jesus christ is your lord and your savior how many of you think yes i could have doubts and still be a Christian. How many of you think, you know, until I clear my doubt, I cannot be a Christian. Actually, this is a very complicated question. There's many people who question whether you can be a Christian and have doubt. Very theologically complicated question. There's many, many who believe that you can be saved and still have doubt. And those who says, no, if you have doubts, how can you be saved? First thing I want to do is walk through this with you. Okay? It doesn't mean that you cannot have questions about the mysteries of God. Questions and doubts is two different things. You can have questions. Why does God do what He does? Why did He create the world like this? Why did He create the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why did He let Satan tempt us? Why did He do this? Why did He do it in this particular way? You can have those questions. It's a mystery that God did what He did the way He did it. You could have questions about, how come he's asking this from me? How come he act, wants me to act this way or that way? How come not my way? I want to believe God this way. How come I have to believe God God's way? You can have questions about the mystery of God. How come God is doing what he's doing? But it does mean that you cannot doubt Jesus or the Father or the Spirit to, to be God. You cannot have doubt that He is a good God. That He is a loving God. My understanding of the Bible is this. If you have doubts whether God is God, whether God died for you, whether God is good God or is a loving God, I don't think you're ready to be baptized. I don't think you can have true salvation if you have doubts about these things. Why do I say that? Because salvation is not knowledge based. Salvation is relationship based. Salvation is to know, okay, earth is round and it's going around the sun. Okay, Jesus Christ died for me and he's my savior. It's not knowledge based. Salvation is relationship based. If I don't have a relationship with God, I could have all the knowledge of God I want. It's not going to save me. It's not going to do any good. There are a lot of people in hell right now who knows plenty of, about God, have knowledge about God, but has never walked with Him, never had a relationship with Him. How do you have a relationship with somebody who you don't think exists? Can you do that? James, I'm glad you said no. Before I met my wife, somebody introduced my wife to me, right? I think I told you this story. So somebody introduced me to my wife. But if my wife wasn't real, if somebody made up my wife and told me, can I have a relationship with her? No. I could have knowledge about where she was born, what year she, what year she was born, what college she went to, what kind of food she likes, what kind of personality she has. 
I could have all that knowledge, but if I don't date her, how can I marry her? Understand? I married my wife because I love her. Oh. <laughs> if I did love my wife, I wouldn't be able to marry her. You cannot have a relationship with God without loving Him. Understand? If you have doubt that He's good, that His love, not only that He exists, but He's desirable. He is worthy of my love. If you don't have this, how can you love Him? And if you don't love Him, how can you be with Him? Understand? So, you could have questions about the mystery of God, but if you're doubting whether God is God, or whether He is good, or whether He is loving, then you are not quite there. Some say this, you know, I have doubts, but I have a relationship with God. How many people have heard that? I've heard that. I heard it from adults too. I have a lot of doubts about God. But you know what? I still have a relationship with God. What does that mean? What kind of relationship are you having? Well, I prayed to Him. Okay. What else? I repent. Okay. Can we get verse 38? Thank you. Man, that's... Okay. Peter replied, what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Before you baptize, what do you have to do? Repent. Now, as I've just said, doubters do not truly know God. If you truly don't know God, can you truly repent? How many of you, who could give me a definition of repent? Jimmy, I think you have a good definition of it. You want to give it a try? Being sorry for your sins. Okay. And there's a little bit more after that. Anybody else? That's a requirement. Yeah. Asking for forgiveness. Okay, asking for forgiveness. So, you have to be, you cannot repent without being sorry, right? Otherwise, you're just giving lip service. You, you, I don't mean it. It's like hitting somebody. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me hit you again. Oh, I'm sorry again. <laughs> you know, that's not right, right? So, you have to be sorry. You have to ask for forgiveness. And what's the another one? There's another one. Part one, part two, there's a third part. Okay, I'll just tell you. Repent basically means I'm going one way, I stop. And I turn around and I go the other way. Repentance is not a passive word, it's an active word. Repentance basically means not only am I sorry, not only am I asking for forgiveness, I'm going to stop the way I'm going and I'm going to come back to God. That's where repentance is. This is God's way. This is my way. I'm walking my way. I realize, oh, this is not the way. That's the way. And I say, God, I'm really sorry I'm going this direction. Forgive me. And I keep on walking this way. I say, God, I'm sorry. You know what? I'm sorry. I can say sorry for the next 10 years. Am I repenting? Am I repenting? Thank you, Sister Bini. We're not repenting. I could say sorry, sorry, forgive me, forgive me, and I'm going further and further away from God. This is not repenting. I'm repenting when? 
you know what? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Now I'm going to go towards you. This is repenting. If you're doubting whether God is good, if you're doubting whether God is desirable, if you're doubting whether I should be with God, and, what, and you're saying repenting of your sin, what do you really mean? A lot of us do something without really thinking about the logical implication of what we're saying. When I'm doubting and I say I'm repenting to God, what that really means is I'm saying I'm sorry. Which means basically you don't have to be a Christian. Does non-Christian know when they're doing something bad? Yes. You don't have to be a Christian to know you're doing something bad, right? I think you have many friends who do something bad that's not Christian and they know that they're doing something bad, right? When they're lying, when they're cheating, when they're bullying, when they're being lustful, they know that this is not good. They don't have to be a Christian to know that. Because God, we're built in the image of God. That's how God made us. You don't have to be a Christian to say you're sorry to somebody because you think you did something wrong. But to repent, to come back to God, you have to acknowledge God. Okay? So, number one, before you bat before being baptized, you have to know for sure that God is your Lord, which means your master and your savior. And number two, you have to repent. If you say you're sorry, but you're not really sorry, which means just keep doing it over and over and over again. It's very hard to look at that as repentance. Since I'm not God, I don't know your heart. But I need to tell you this, that before you baptize, you need to truly repent. It means to know that you are in the wrong. Not only that you are doing something that is wrong, but the entirety of your life, your thoughts, your perspective, your outlook in life, that you have lived to date because you live without considering God, it's wrong. That's what you're saying, okay? What you're repenting is not that I did something wrong, but every single breath that I took, every single thought that I had was wrong just because I never considered God in those things. That's the wrong. Not my individual, I looked at something I shouldn't have looked at. I did something I shouldn't have done. Your existence, if it was without God, it's not right. So many youth grow cold in their faith and abandon God because they do not fully understand what they are committing to when they make a vow to become a Christian. How many of you ever feel or felt like you're drifting away from God? Let me see your hand. Ever felt like you drifted away from God? What happened? You know, I went to the, those revival meetings with our youth, and it's fire, I'm telling you. Those revival meetings, you know, the, the, the music is, is just, and the, it just, I could feel the presence of God in that revival meeting. And kids are supercharged. I mean, I feel that Holy Spirit just come and just touch their heart. They're convicted. I see our kids there, and they're convicted of their sins. And they come to God and say, God, I'm sorry. There's altar calls. And our kids get up and say, you know, I'm really sorry. I'm going to rededicate my life to God. They make this commitment to follow Christ and to live for Christ, okay? 
But then what happened? Then Monday comes. They go to school, they read the Bible, they pray, and then they feel as they're, they're not feeling that presence of God anymore. A little bit, little bit less, less. They feel like, what's going on? And then some of them question their heart. Was I really filled with the Holy Spirit? Or was I just on a spiritual trip? Was I just on a spiritual high? Maybe it wasn't real. Some question their heart, and then others question God. Maybe God wasn't real. Maybe all of that thing was like a, was an emotional just experience. Some abandon God, but most, listen to me, most live joyless Christian lives. Understand? I, I see a lot of youth being emotionally high. At, I mean, when I was in high school, I think I was emotionally high and low maybe I don't know, five times, six times a year. Really high. I don't have to be at a revival meeting. I'm just sitting here. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing this praise and I'm just filled with God. And I turn around and somebody says something and I'm really low. And I'm like, oh God, can you, what's going on? And then it's really high. And then my youth pastor says something really low. And I'm going through this thing. But most Christians that I know, most youth that I know, they don't abandon God because of that. They just what? They just live joyless Christian lives. The kind of Christian life that the non-Christians are turned off by. Man, if you're a Christian, I don't want to be a Christian. You look terrible. <laughs> you look depressed. I don't want to be like that. That's a terrible thing to do. To say that you're a Christian and to live a joyless life. So why does this thing happen? Stick with me a little bit more, almost done. We already talked about this last year in one of my sermons, but we, Luke chapter 14, it's not up here. It's about counting the cost. How many of you remember that sermon? Counting the cost. There's a person who's building a house. What it says is, you should think about building your house to count the cost before you build the house. Because what happens, you build a house, halfway there, you run out of money. Do you have a house? No. Can you live in it? No. Have you spent money in there? Yes. And basically, in the Bible says, you look like a fool. People are going to think, you know what? That guy is just totally an idiot. Look at that. He's got four posts up. He's got a roof. And that's it. Luke says what? You have to count your cost before you go to battle, before you go to war. Because if you don't think, hmm, can I win this war? If you, how many kings don't think about that cost? If you don't think about that cost, you go, you, you go to war, and what happens if you lose? You're going to get killed. We see it in the Bible a lot. They get their eyes plucked out. They're in hand. They're, they're like chains. They're living with rats in the dungeon. They're eating pigsty food. I mean, there's a big cost to pay if you lose that war. Understand? And then he says, you have to count your cost before committing to Jesus Christ. It's a vow that I take for all of my life. Committing to God, following Jesus Christ, entering through the narrow gate, is not a commitment for as long as I feel like it. It's not a commitment as long as I have a feeling in my heart. No. It's a vow that I take for all of my life, through the good and the bad, through my spiritual high, through my spiritual low, through the times when I feel God's presence, and when I don't feel God's presence, when I have joy because of a relationship, and when I'm in depression, when I'm in pain because I lost the relationship. Through the warmth of family get-together and the desperation of cancer in the family member. Through all of this, it's a commitment to love God. 
Understand? This is the cost. Not only when I feel like it. It's a commitment to carry your cross daily. Yesterday I dropped it. I got really angry at my brother and I cursed at him. You! I got really angry and I got jealous and I gossiped on my girlfriend. I went to the place I shouldn't have went. I looked at things I shouldn't have looked at. I thought things I shouldn't have thought. I imagined things I shouldn't have imagined. Okay. The commitment is today, I ask for forgiveness for that. Turn, look at God, and try to carry my cross today. That's the commitment that God wants. God's not saying you have to live perfect lives because He knows it's already too late. It ain't going to happen. But you need to desire to. Like I said, you know, James kind of smirk when I say I love my wife. You know, but I don't think of my wife 24 hours in my head, right? I don't. I don't do that, right? I'd be a real, real guy if I did that. I might have done something to upset her that day, okay? But my vow in marriage is tomorrow I get up, what do I do? Okay, I love my wife. So let me go over this with you. Before you're baptized, you have to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not only your Savior, He has to be your Master. You have to count the cost. Am I ready to do this for the rest of my life? Am I ready to give up everything and put Jesus Christ first? That's the commitment. You know what? Many people live joyless Christian lives because they take that commitment, but they never take it seriously. Okay, I made the commitment, but I live the life that I want to live. Am I going to be happy? No, because that's not God's way. We ask God to make us happy without God. God can't do that. He, that's impossible. It's like God to ask you a round square. Can God give you a round square? No, that's impossible. If you ask God to make you happy without God, God cannot do it for you. Understand? When you say, I want to follow you, Jesus Christ, but you never count the cost, and you live the life you want, and then you question God, and then you, God, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm going to follow you, but I'm living a joyless life. I'm not happy right now. You can't blame God. Baptism. Before baptism, you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to come to cost and say, I'm going to love Him no matter what. It's a vow for a lifetime. Not when you're spiritually high. Not when you feel like it. So who does not need to be baptized? If you're already committed to Jesus Christ, really committed to Jesus Christ, like I just said, through the ups and downs, through the, through the, the highs and the lows, if you're committed to daily quiet time with Him, if you're committed to picking up the cross and walking with Jesus Christ every single day, and you've been baptized, you don't need to be baptized again. Understand? You're already good. Who should not be baptized? If you don't care about God, if God is not really relevant in your life, Okay, I believe him, but you know, my daily life, I don't really care. You're not ready to be baptized. Don't be bad. You should not be baptized. If you counted the cost and you thought, hmm, am I ready to crucify myself with Christ on that cross? Uh, no. I do trust him. I do, I do acknowledge that he's God and my Lord. I did count the cost, but I'm not ready. You should not be baptized. Understand? It's like, if I marry my wife, I take my vow. Okay, I'm going to take a vow, but I'm telling my wife, you know, I'm going to love you as, feel as, as long as I feel like it. If I don't feel like loving you, you know what? Bye-bye. Because, uh, you know, you're not the one, obviously, because I don't feel that have, have my feelings for you ran out. 
That's not it. That's not a vow. Vow is a promise you promise to keep no matter what the cost is. Okay. So who should be baptized? If you count the cost and really want to desire God above everything else, you're promising God, I may fall, not I may fall, I will fall. I must fall. I will fall. I'm not going to love you every single day of my life. But you know, God, you know what I'm going to promise you? I'm going to get up the next day and I'm going to try again. I'm going to sin today, but I'm going to repent. And I'm going to pick up that cross tomorrow and I'm going to follow you. If you're ready to make that commitment, then you are ready to be baptized. And come and talk to me after class. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. We are young, but that doesn't mean we are mindless, Lord. We are young, but it doesn't mean we're not mature. We know what we're doing. We know who we are. We know what's in our hearts. Help us to really look into our hearts and ask ourselves if we desire you, if we have the desire to desire you more than anything else in this world. I pray that we would honestly and maturely look into our heart and know where we truly are. And if we are not ready, I pray that we will pray to you and, and ask you to help us be ready to love you with all of our love. And I pray that if we are, that we would take that step forward and make that vow, make that commitment to love you through my junior high years, my high school years, my college years, and throughout the rest of my life. I pray that you would have grace and mercy on this youth and know that you will lovingly wait for them with open arms as you would wait for a prodigal son. That you are always waiting for us. And we thank you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that Amen. <clears throat>